Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr. Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibella Harold. Welcome to lesson number 10, ready for teaching on December 3. It's titled The Fires of Hell, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word provides us with so much information. We also thank you that it provides us the way to salvation and also a greater understanding of who you are and how you act and respond in relation to us. And Lord, we just thank you that the Bible also shows us that Jesus came and lived and died and was raised again, that each of us could have eternal life. But in between, there's that time when most of us will rest in the grave. But uh, there are questions about hell and what that means. And this week, as we open your word and discuss that, as we see what you have for us there, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. We also would like to pray for those who are listening in various parts of the world, for those listening in Lagos in Nigeria or Kampala in Uganda or Kuwait and Doha and in Belize in the Inter-American area and Barcelona in Spain and St Albans in the United Kingdom and those listening through Christian Record Services out of Nebraska in the United States, those listening in Proserpine in Australia, Nandi in Fiji, Christchurch in New Zealand and Karachi in Pakistan and Lord let's not forget those who are listening in Seoul in South Korea. As we listen to your word this week, as we listen to this Sabbath school lesson, may it be a blessing to each of us and may we be able to share your love with those about us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. Test all things, hold fast what is good. Let's try that again. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Test all things, hold fast what is good. Italian poet Dante Alighieri, who lived from 1265 to 1321 AD, wrote his famous work The Divine Comedy about a fictional journey of the soul after death. The soul went either to the inferno, hell, within the earth, or to purgatory, where the human spirit can purge itself and become worthy of ascending to heaven, or to paradise, to the presence of God himself. Though only a poem, fiction, Dante's words ended up having a great deal of influence on Christian theology, especially Roman Catholic theology. The basic notion of an immortal soul's going either to hell or to purgatory or to paradise is foundational to that church. Many conservative Protestant denominations also believe in an immortal soul that after death ascends either to paradise or descends to hell. Indeed, if the human soul never dies, then it has to go somewhere after the body dies. In short, a false understanding of human nature has led to terrible theological errors. This week, we will deal with some of these unbiblical theories, as well as with the biblical view of what happens after death. Sunday, November 27. Immortal Worms? Compare Mark 9, verses 42 to 48, with Isaiah 66, verse 24. How do you understand the expression, their worm does not die, in verse 48 of chapter 9 in Mark? Mark 9, 42 to 48. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 
It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands, to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die, and the fire not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And... Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24, which reads in the NIV, And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. Some interpret the singular noun worm in Mark 9.48 as an allusion to the supposed disembodied soul or spirit of the wicked that, after death, flies into hell, where it never dies and suffers eternal torment. But this interpretation does not reflect the biblical notion of unconscious death. It also ignores the Old Testament background of this passage. Actually, the singular, the worm, is used generically for the worms. It does not mean a single worm. The reference is to worms which feed upon the decaying bodies, writes Robert G. Bratcher and Eugene A. Nieder in a translator's handbook of the Gospel of Mark, page 304. In Mark 9.48, Jesus is quoting Isaiah 66.24, which reads, And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched. And they will be loathsome to all mankind. This frightening metaphorical scene portrays a battlefield with God's enemies dead on the ground and being destroyed. The bodies not consumed by fire are decomposed by worms, or perhaps first by worms and then by fire. Either way, there is no reference whatever to any alleged soul escaping the destruction of the body and flying into hell. But what about the worms that never die? The metaphorical language of Isaiah 66.24, quoted in Mark 9.48, does not imply that those worms are immortal. Immortal worms? The emphasis is on the fact that the worms do not leave their destructive task incomplete. In other words, they continue to devour the bodies of the wicked until these bodies are destroyed. By contrast, God's faithful children will joyfully abide in, as it says in Isaiah 66, 22 and 23, the new heavens and the new earth, and worship God in his presence. Let's read Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. With such contrasting destinies in mind, no wonder God stated that it would be far better for someone to enter the kingdom of God without a crucial part of his or her body, without a hand or a foot or even an eye, than to have a perfect body that will be destroyed by worms and fire. As we read in verses 42 to 48, over and over again. So to finish today, in the end, we are either totally saved or totally lost. There is no middle ground. We can have either eternal life or we'll face eternal destruction. What choices do you have to make today? How should this reality, eternal life or eternal destruction, impact those choices?
Monday, November 28, The Fires of Hell. In his booklet for children titled The Sight of Hell, published in 1874, English Roman Catholic priest John Furness illustrates the eternal torment by means of a great solid iron ball, larger than the heavens and the earth. A bird comes once in a hundred millions of years and just touches the great iron ball with a feather of its wing, on page 24. Furness argues that the burning of sinners in hell continues even after that iron ball is worn away by such occasional feather touches. The sad thing is, many Protestants even today believe in something similar for the lost. Read Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 and Jude verse 7. How can these passages help us better understand the notion of eternal fire or the idea, as Jesus expressed it, that the lost will be in everlasting fire in Matthew 18.8 or in a fire that shall never be quenched in Mark 9.43. Let's begin with Malachi 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. And Jude 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The word eternal, the Hebrew word olam, O-L-A-M, or Greek aion, A-I-O-N, or A-I-O-N-I-O-S, carries different meanings depending on the immediate context. For example, when associated with God, as in Deuteronomy 33 verse 27, it's everlasting. The word expresses his eternity. When related to human beings in Exodus 21 verse 6, it is forever. The word is limited by their lifespan. When qualifying fire in Matthew 18.8 and Matthew 25.41, it's everlasting. It implies that the fire will not go out until it fully consumes what is being burned. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 27. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. Exodus 21, verse 6, Then his master shall bring him to the judges, he shall also bring him to the door, or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him for ever. Remembering that's forever. And Matthew 18, verse 8, If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet, to be cast into the everlasting fire. And Matthew 25, verse 41, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This means that the eternal fire will be eternal in the sense that it will consume the wicked completely and irreversibly, leaving them neither root nor branch, as it says in Malachi 4 verse 1. The theory of an everlasting punishment of the wicked has serious implications. If the wicked are punished forever, then evil will never be eradicated. Also, all human life derives from God. We read in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 39, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. And Psalm 36 verse 9, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And that's the God who has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, as expressed in Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Why then would he continue to grant life to the wicked to suffer in endless torment? 
Would it not be much more reasonable for him just to end their existence? If the wicked will be punished according to their works, as it says in Revelation 20 verse 12, why then should a short human life be punished endlessly? All Bible references to the eternal fire should be seen as allusions to the post-millennium lake of fire of Revelation 20, which we'll look at in Lesson 13. Thus, it is unbiblical to speak of an already present, ever-burning hell. And so to finish the day, as unfortunate as the fires of hell are, what does the truth about hell reveal to us about God's love, especially in contrast to the idea of eternal torment? Tuesday, November 29. The Saints in Purgatory. The Roman Catholic Church holds that the dead who do not deserve hell, but who are not yet ready for paradise, can have their sins purged in purgatory and then ascend from there to paradise. Their sufferings in purgatory can be reduced by the prayers and penances of loved ones. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is explicit about purgatory. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. That's the Catechism of the Catholic Church, published by Doubleday in 1995, page 291. It states, too, that their suffering can be alleviated by the prayers of their loved ones, as well as by other acts on behalf of the dead. The Church also commends almsgiving, indulgences and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. Page 291. Read Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, and it Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 20 to 22 and Hebrews 9 27. How do these passages refute the theory of purgatory? First of all, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And Ezekiel 18, 20 to 22. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. And Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. The dogma of purgatory combines the pagan notion of a burning hell with the pagan practice of praying for the dead. This dogma is unacceptable for those who believe in the biblical teachings. One, that the dead remain resting unconsciously in their graves, as we uh, have read in Ecclesiastes 9.10, that the righteousness of one fallen human being cannot be transferred to another fallen human being, as we read in Ezekiel 18.20-22, Three, that our only mediator is Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And four, that death is followed by the final judgment without any second chance to repent from the pitfalls of this life, as we've just read in Hebrews 9.27. An even more serious implication is how the anti-biblical theory of purgatory distorts God's own character. Indeed, 
Ellen White writes in Manuscript 51, published in 1890, Satan's work since his fall is to misinterpret our Heavenly Father. He suggested the dogma of the immortality of the soul. The idea of an eternally burning hell was the production of Satan. Purgatory is his invention. These teachings falsify the character of God that he shall be regarded as severe, revengeful, arbitrary and not exercising forgiveness. End of quote. Instead of the dead asleep, awaiting Christ's return, this view says they're in purgatory, suffering, suffering there until someone manages to get them out. And so to finish the day, what do such errors as purgatory or eternal torment teach us about the importance of doctrine? Why is what we believe of importance and not just in whom we believe? Wednesday, November 30, A Paradise with Disembodied Souls Though Protestants don't accept purgatory, many nevertheless believe that the souls of the righteous dead are already enjoying paradise in the very presence of God. Some argue that those souls are just disembodied spirits. Others believe they are disembodied spirits, but covered by a spiritual body of glory. Whatever the supposed metaphysical state of the living dead, these theories undermine the biblical doctrine of the final resurrection and judgment of the dead. Why is there a resurrection and a judgment in Revelation 20 if the souls of the righteous are already enjoying paradise? Let's read Revelation 20 verses 12 to 14. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Read Acts chapter 2, verses 29, 34 and 35, and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 to 18. How do these passages shed light on the state of the dead and those awaiting resurrection? Acts 2, verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us, to this day. And verse 34, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. In verse 35. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 to 18. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. The Bible teaches that all human beings who were already in heaven were either translated alive, as in the case of Enoch, and Elijah, or resurrected from the dead, as Moses and those raised with Christ. Let's look at each of those as Genesis 5.24 about Enoch. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9-11, to 11, dealing with Elijah, and so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what, what, what may I do for you, before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. For if not, it shall not be so. 
Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Moses in Jude 9, yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. And then Christ in Matthew twenty seven fifty one to fifty three. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. As we've already seen, the allusion to the souls under the altar crying to vengeance for God in Revelation chapter 6 is just a metaphor for justice and does not prove the theory of the natural immortality of the soul. Let's read that again. Revelation 6 beginning at verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Otherwise, these folks hardly sound as if they're enjoying their eternal reward. In reality, the grave is a place of rest for the dead, who are unconsciously awaiting the final resurrection, when their conscious existence will be restored. The dead, even the righteous dead, are not disembodied souls drifting around heaven, waiting patiently to be reunited with their bodies at the final resurrection. Also, what could Paul possibly be talking about in 1 Corinthians 15:18 when he says that if there were no resurrection of the dead, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished? How could they have perished if they are already in the bliss of heaven and have been there for however long since they died? A central and key doctrine of the New Testament, the resurrection of the dead when Christ returns, is made null and void by the false teaching that the righteous dead soar off to their eternal reward right after they die. Nevertheless, we hear it all the time, especially at funerals. And so to finish the day, what are ways in which you could help people understand that the idea that the dead are asleep in the ground is really good news, in the sense that they truly are at rest and know no pain and suffering? Thursday, December 1, The Biblical View Read 1 John chapter 5, verses 3 to 11. Why does the Apostle John limit eternal life only to those who are in Christ? 1 John 5, beginning at verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself, 
And he who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The biblical doctrine of conditional immortality of the human being, in contrast to the non-biblical theory of the natural immortality of the soul, is made explicit in 1 John 5 verses 11 and 12. Let me read those two verses again. And this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. To grasp the meaning of this significant passage, we have to remember that only the Godhead has immortality, as we read in 1 Timothy 6, verses 15 and 16, which he will manifest in his own time. He, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. And is the only source of life, as we read in Psalm 36 verse 9, For with you is the fountain of life, in your light we see light. And Colossians 1 verses 15 to 17, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all all things consist. And Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2 has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. When sin entered the world through the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, they and all their descendants, including us, came under the curse of physical death and lost the gift of eternal life. But our loving God implemented the plan of salvation for human beings to regain eternal life, the life that was to have been theirs from the start. As Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The Apostle Paul explains that just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, so through the one man, Jesus Christ, the gracious gift of eternal life became available to all human beings. And we read about that in Romans 5 verses 12 to 21. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offence, for if by the one man's offence many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offence resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offences resulted in justification. For, if by the one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offence judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. 
For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul here is making an unambiguous reference to a literal Adam who brought sin and death into this world. One cannot make sense of anything in the Bible without a literal Adam who, through transgression, brought sin and death into our world. Thus, the Apostle John adds in 1 John 5, 11 and 12, God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The whole picture becomes clearer in light of Jesus' statements in John 6, 40. Everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up. At the last day, and in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. This means that eternal life is a gift of God through Christ, which is secured in the present, but fully enjoyed only after the final resurrection of the righteous. The conclusion is very simple. If eternal life is granted only to those who are in Christ, then those who are not in him do not have everlasting life. As we read above in 1 John 5, 11 and 12, God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. By contrast, the theory of the natural immortality of the soul grants everlasting life, whether in paradise or in hell, to all human beings, even to those who are not in Christ. However popular this teaching is, it is not biblical. Friday, December 2. From the Great Controversy, page 545, we read, Upon the fundamental error of natural immortality rests the doctrine of consciousness in death, a doctrine like eternal torment opposed to the teachings of the scriptures, to the dictates of reason and to our feelings of humanity. According to the popular belief, the redeemed in heaven are acquainted with all that takes place on the earth and especially with the lives of the friends whom they've left behind. But how could it be a source of happiness to the dead to know the troubles of the living, to witness the sins committed by their own loved ones, and to see them enduring all the sorrows, disappointments and anguish of life? How much of heaven's bliss would be enjoyed by those who were hovering over their friends on earth? And how utterly revolting is the belief that as soon as the breath leaves the body, the soul of the impenitent is consigned to the flames of hell. To what depths of anguish must those be plunged who see their friends passing to the grave unprepared to enter upon an eternity of woe and sin? End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Those who have talked to other Christians about the state of the dead and the nature of hell have most likely discovered just how adamant and firm people are in their belief, not only in the idea that the saved immediately go to heaven, but also that the lost are in the eternal torment of hell. Why do you think that is? It's one thing, understandable somewhat, for them to want to believe that their deceased loved ones are with the Lord, Though, as we've seen, there's still the question of how upsetting it would be for them to see the mess of things down here. But why is there such a strong attachment to the horrific idea that the lost are being eternally tormented in hell? 
What does this fact teach us about just how powerful tradition can be? Discuss this in class. 2. Most Christian denominations are proclaiming the unbiblical theory of the natural immortality of the soul with all its correlated theories. What else should we do as a church, in addition to what we are already doing, to proclaim to the world the biblical view of death and the afterlife? And three, though Dante's poem, The Divine Comedy, was mere fiction, it became very influential in helping cement in people's minds false teachings about what happens to the soul after death. What lessons can we learn from how easily Christian theology can be influenced by outside teachings? What other non-Christian ideas influence Christian thought even today? And how can we protect ourselves from them? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Modesty, Modesty, Modesty by the Okra Matengu. People came in a seemingly constant procession to look pityingly on two-year-old Akurios in the hospital in Katima Malilo, Nambia. The boy had been ill for months and the people wept as they saw his terrible pain. The hospital is failing us, one told Akurios' parents. You should consult with the witch doctor. God will understand, said another. Just do it. After the last visitor left, father turned to mother. What should we do? He said. Maybe the people are right. Jesus will understand. Mother couldn't bear to see her only child in pain. She agreed. The witch doctor declared that witches had cast an evil spell on the boy and that he would recover with traditional medicine. The parents bought the witch doctor's medicine and gave some to the boy daily. But the more medicine they gave, the worse he got. Father began to pray earnestly. Lord Jesus, I know I've made a mistake, he said. I departed from your saving grace. Speak to me, Lord, for the sake of my child. You healed lepers and made the blind to see and the lame to walk. Do that for my child too. A short time later, Father had a dream. As he slept, he heard a voice call by him by his name, Modesty. Modesty, 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 the voice said. This is my child. Why have you tainted him with evil spirits? I don't want you to be involved with any witch doctors if you want him to live. Shaken, Father got up and threw away the traditional medicine. He remembered hearing a Seventh-day Adventist physician give health presentations at camp meeting, and he took the boy to him. The physician diagnosed a curios with pneumonia and tuberculosis and sent him to a hospital where he could be treated. Father continued to pray and mother joined him. They placed their full trust in Jesus. A curios now is 22. A curios's parents, Modesty and Rebecca Kakula, went on to have four more children. But with the birth of each child, they refused to take part in the traditional ceremony that townspeople hold for newborns. Instead, they took their babies to the Seventh-day Adventist church to be dedicated to Jesus. For this mission story, the reader is asked to pray for people who sincerely accept Jesus but struggle to forsake traditions fully. These people end up with two levels of religion, a theoretical religion based on the Bible and a practical religion grounded in culture. They embrace Bible teachings, but when faced with real-life challenges, revert to tradition. Seventh-day Adventist missionaries seek to contextualize the gospel to facilitate personal Christian growth among these people and to help them realize that traditional practices don't work. Thank you for your mission offerings that help spread a contextualized gospel around the world. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. 
Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.